The scripture today is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. It's found in the, in the New Testament, in the Pew Bible, on page 118. Hear the word of the Lord. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking with, about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? The Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Tom. Well, when I was a, a kid, I was awestruck by the Apollo space mission. President Kennedy had set this rather audacious mission of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by the end of the 1960s. And it was an audacious, difficult, and dangerous mission. You know, when you try to go to another world... It is incredibly dangerous. In fact, three astronauts died during training for Apollo 1. But then two and a half years later, as Apollo 11 was preparing to take these astronauts to the moon, President Nixon assigned columnist William Sapphire to write a speech titled this, In the Event of Moon Disaster. You see, if anything went wrong on that mission, President Nixon was going to go on TV, read that speech, radio communication to the astronauts was going to be cut off, they would be left to die, and a minister would commend their souls to the deepest of the deep. But that's not what happened. On July 20th, 1969, with less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining, the lunar module touched down on the Sea of Tranquility, and Commander Neil Armstrong stepped down that ladder and placed his foot on the gray, powdery surface of the moon. It was the first time a human being had gone to another celestial body, and in his now famous words, Armstrong said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A few days later, when Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins splashed down in the Pacific, the USS Hornet awaited them. Aboard the ship, President Nixon was there to personally welcome them home. And they had victory parades in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And they attended a dinner with 44 governors, members of Congress, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and President Nixon gave each of the astronauts a Presidential Medal of Freedom. What a great, great celebration. The human race had successfully completed the most significant and most difficult technological achievement up to that time. And when Jesus Christ accomplished his mission of love and redemption, when he went through the cloud and landed on heaven's shores, all of heaven broke out in celebration. In fact, the prophet Daniel had been given a spiritual glimpse into that moment. Daniel 7, 
13 and 14 says this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And so today we're celebrating the triumphal return of Jesus Christ to heaven, his enthronement at the right hand of God, and the celebration that his mission was successfully accomplished. And of course, when a mission is successfully accomplished, there are others who share in the benefits. We certainly saw this recently when SEAL Team 6 assassinated Osama bin Laden. Their success enabled about 250 million Americans to breathe easier. But what are the benefits that Jesus shares with us in this victory celebration of his ascension? The first benefit is that we, that we have as a result of Christ's ascension is power over sin, death, and the devil. Without the mission of Jesus Christ, there is really not a lot of hope for you when temptation comes your way. Now, you might even be a person of unusual willpower, but even you don't have much hope. But Jesus has come, and he has shown us that it is possible to be tempted and not give in. He's shown us that even though he was hated, he did not retaliate. Instead, he responded to his enemies in love and truth. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet he overcame sin. He accomplished his mission to defeat sin, and he was given the very power of God. And his power resides within us, so that we too can overcome the temptation of sin. We share in Christ's power, and this is a new reality because of Christ's successful mission. Well, what about death? You know, people are pretty freaked out about death. They try not to think about it. It's a, it's a terror to human existence. But remember what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He said, when I broke out of death, I trampled down death. My mission is accomplished. I've overcome death, and you don't need to fear it. You see, death is not the period at the end of a sentence. It's a comma. Now, what about the devil? Have you ever experienced the, the palpable presence of evil, either in a situation or in a person? You know what? You don't need to live in fear of that. Jesus stared down the devil in the wilderness. He overcame him at every turn, and he ultimately threw him down and broke his back at the cross and at the resurrection. Jesus has ascended in triumph. So his mission is accomplished, and he shares his power both with you and with me. 1 John 4 is correct. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You don't need to fear the devil. Now there are 365 days in a year. Is that correct? Just see if you're still with me. 365 days, Lisa, in a year. Less than 2% of those days, 7 of those days, are considered the principal feast for Christians. And this day, Ascension Day, is one of those. The others are Christmas, Epiphany, Easter, Pentecost, Trinity, and All Saints, in case you wanted to know. While Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil is certainly significant, there are even more benefits. A second benefit that comes to us through the triumphal ascension of Jesus is that you and I, we now have access to Jesus Christ anytime, anywhere. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he was painfully limited. 
he came as a baby. And he was totally dependent on two peasants by the name of Mary and Joseph. You see, just like all of us, he could only be in one place at one time. He couldn't be in Nazareth and Jerusalem simultaneously. If you were sick laying on your cot in Jerusalem hoping for help, you'd, better, you'd have to just wait until he physically came to Jerusalem. But 40 days after his resurrection, there was a shift. Let's read about that in Acts 1.8. Jesus was giving final instructions to his followers, and he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And then in verses 9 to 11, he says, And when they'd said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him from their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, at first, Jesus' ascension doesn't seem particularly positive or beneficial because he's taken away from us. But what happened is that he was moved into a whole new dimension. He's been removed from this sort of space-time dimension to a dimension beyond space and time. In that he is available to any of us, anytime, anywhere. There is nowhere that you could go where Christ's presence, power, and immediacy are not available to you. There is no time when you will call on his name that he won't respond. Now, cell phone companies like to brag about how great their coverage is, don't they? And they tend to exaggerate how good the coverage really is. If you live in Indian shores up here, you know about that. When Jesus was on earth, he had a very tightly defined geographical mission. He said he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was called the king of the Jews. And his mission was tightly and geographically focused on one tiny Roman province of Judea. If you were in Italy, tough luck. Jesus' coverage was nothing compared to Verizon. But now, now through the ascension... Jesus has risen up into heaven, and his glory and his power extends over the whole world. You can be in Chicago and call on the name of Jesus. You can be in Nigeria and call on his power. Wherever you are, in the emergency room, on an airplane, or late up late at night with a sick child, Jesus is right there with you. And even if you forget to pray to him, Guess what? He prays for you. You might think, what in the world is Jesus doing up there in heaven? I mean, down here he was teaching and healing and doing miracles. What's Jesus doing in heaven? The Bible tells us very specifically that he is continually interceding for you and for me. He's praying for you and for me. You might be in the midst of, of a terrible situation and also be thinking, this situation is too big for me. I wish somebody would pray for me. Well, you've got it. Jesus is doing just that. Whatever your need, Jesus is praying for you. The book of Romans tells us that the Spirit also intercedes for us. But I think it can still be said that this is a special ministry of Jesus Christ to intercede for us. I mean, Jesus grew and he sweated and he even sweated great drops of blood. He, he experienced the troubles of this life. He was tempted in every way that we are. He was spat upon, he was rejected, he was tortured. Whatever hellacious thing life brings your way, it's been dealt to Jesus as well. And he understands, and he prays for you. When we deal with difficult situations, we naturally want to go to somebody who has experienced the same thing. 
people who, who are able to relate to us are often the most encouraging people for us. I think that's why support groups work so well. There is this common bond of shared experience. And right now, before the very throne of God, you have someone who knows what you are going through and he's interceding for you. Anytime, anywhere, you have access to Jesus and Jesus is praying for you. Now, I think that's pretty amazing and a tremendous, tremendous gift. Now, lastly, as a result of Christ's ascension, these lowly bodies of ours are now destined for glory. Now, I think everybody I know is disappointed with his or her body to some extent. Is there anybody here who thinks their body's just superb? <laughs> well, maybe Linston back there. He's pretty studly looking. <clears throat> some people want to lose some weight. Some people want a smaller nose or more hair. Others are fighting illnesses. A friend of mine told me about a New York author who launched a website where people can log on and anonymously express their feelings about their bodies. I went and looked at the site, and nobody there said they felt great about their body. The site even has a feature for you to click been there if you resonate with something somebody else posted. Now, here are some of the statements that got a lot of been there check marks. I eat when I'm depressed, and then I get more depressed. I hate everything about my body and often feel guilty because I should be thankful that I even have a healthy body. I have no missing limbs, no diseases, no actual faults. I'm tired and exhausted of hating this blessed body. And I just want to look in the mirror and be happy for once. Friends, we have bodies that embarrass us, bother us, drag us down. They're flawed and they're wearing out. We're all going to die. Is there any hope for us? Well, the amazing truth, the amazing truth of the ascension is that a human body has entered into heaven. A human body has entered glory. A human body will live forever. A human body is forever in the very presence of God. Now, some people believe that when God saw our human plight and came to us as Jesus at Christmas, he sort of put on this little human uniform and lived out his human life, and then following the cross and the resurrection, he was really glad to take it off. Well, that's heresy. For 2,000 years, Christians have taught that Jesus went all the way when he took on our humanity. Not only did he take on every aspect of humanity, he took it on forever. One of the Anglican creeds puts it like this. Christ did truly rise again from death and took again his body. Furthermore, it says, with flesh, bones, and all things appertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven, and there he sitteth until he returns to judge all men on the last day. Now this shatters the paradigm that many people ascribe to that heaven is this purely ethereal place. Now certainly it's true that angels and archangels and odd living creatures called cherubim and seraphim live in heaven. But we must realize that Jesus through his ascension has taken humanity into the very presence of God. In the throne room of God, God the Son has a body with scar tissue on it. You see, right now your body is weak. But one day, like the ascended Christ it will be strong. Right now, your body might be a little disappointing, but someday it will be dynamic. Right now, your body is passing away, but in heaven, like the ascended Christ, it will live forever. Now, when I was graduating from high school, there was this thing called superlatives. Did any of you have those? 
worked like this. Toward the end of our senior year, the senior student body took a vote among the class for different categories like who was the most handsome or the most athletic or who was most likely to succeed and so forth. And you know, the geeks and the dweebs never got a superlative. But because of the ascension, Jesus has voted that these geeky, awkward bodies are in fact most likely to succeed. Our bodies are going to ascend into heaven and they will be honored in the presence of God. Christianity is a physical religion. It honors the body that you've been given by God and someday you will live with God forever. And by the way, you're also going to live with all these other Christians. So I hope you start to like them a little bit more. <clears throat> Do you see why we celebrate the ascension? As a result of the ascension, you and I have lasting confidence over sin, death, and the devil. Because of the ascension, you and I now have access to the immediacy, the power, and the prayers of Jesus Christ anytime, anywhere. And because of the ascension, our lowly bodies are destined for glory. The Bible says this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let us worship him today and rejoice in his benefits. Amen and hallelujah.